Good morning. As you can see, or as you can guess, I'm still in Kuala Lumpur. And a lot of my days have begun here beside the uh, Klang River at the uh, Pasar Seni uh, LRT station. And that's because I often take the LRT to begin my day. Or I walk across the pedestrian bridge across the Klang River and head in that direction. And today I'm going across the bridge. And that's because I'm going to the KL Butterfly Park. I know when I say butterflies, you know, it doesn't bring to mind heart-stopping excitement and adrenaline and heart-pounding. But I love butterflies, I love insects, and I live, or my hostel is quite close to this place. So it's kind of a no-brainer to uh, wake up on a Sunday morning, grab my camera, and uh, head to the butterfly park. Let's go. The butterfly park is in almost exactly the same spot as the bird park where I went a few days ago. So I'm following the same route to get there, the same tunnels, the same bridges, the same weird route through the uh, parking garage. That's how I know to get there. In fact, the butterfly park is in the same valley as the bird park and it has a similar design in that it's a bit of rainforest that they've developed to mimic the butterfly's natural habitat and it has a huge net over the top to keep the butterflies uh, inside. And this pedestrian bridge gets you over this. This butterfly park is listed as the largest butterfly garden in the world. I think it's about 80,000 square feet though I don't really know what that means, you know, how big is 80,000 square feet, but it's probably pretty big. They're supposed to have 120 different species of butterflies and between five and 6,000 butterflies fluttering around at uh, any one point. And they also have a whole bunch of educational exhibits about the life cycle of butterflies. More about that in a few minutes and they have an exhibit of uh, beetles and all kinds of other insects from around the world. And I love those, so I'm looking forward to that. The bird park opens at uh, 9 in the morning and closes at 6 p.m. And if I remember right, the entrance fee is 12 ringgit for Malaysians, and you have to show your Malaysian ID, your MyCat, to pay that price. And I think for uh, children, it's 7 ringgit. For people like me, foreigners, you have to double that price. I think it currently costs 25 ringgit for foreigners, ad adults, and 14 ringgit for children. And I think they have a family deal as well for Malaysian families. Much cheaper price, you can bring your whole family in. So that's something to look into if you have a family. A bit earlier I mentioned the life cycle of butterflies and, and how it, it fascinates me. I mean, we all know the basics, right? A butterfly lays eggs on a tree, on a leaf. The eggs hatch and little caterpillars come out, the larvae and the caterpillars. Their job is just to eat and eat and eat and eat. That's all they do is eat. And they grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And when they reach a certain size, you know, they hang themselves underneath the leaf. Some of them spin a silk cocoon. Others make a, like a hard chrysalis on the outside. And then uh, they hang there for a while and inside the caterpillar turns into a butterfly four weeks later or however long it takes for each species you know the butterfly emerges pumps up its wings the wings kind of harden and then it flies off and the butterfly's main job is basically to find a mate and lay eggs fertilized eggs and the whole cycle starts again that's what we learned in elementary school and at that time we see all these nice animations and cartoons 
that show the caterpillar transforming into a butterfly. And this is where things get interesting because that's completely wrong. In my head, I still have this image of what I saw in school where you actually see the body of the caterpillar changing into the body of a butterfly. And when you teach it to children, I guess that makes sense. It's the simplest version. But what really happens is much more interesting. I don't know if I explained that very well. Let me uh, give an example. Is that the way we are taught about this would be like if you imagine me turning into a butterfly. Here's my face. And to turn into a butterfly, you know, I have to grow antennas out of the top of my head. My eyes maybe have to grow bigger. My mouth has to change and I have to develop the long proboscis for getting a nectar. So you imagine my head changing shape and things growing out of it and things disappearing. And that's how I always imagined the caterpillar turned into a butterfly. But that's not what happens at all. What really happens is much more interesting and quite a bit more complicated when you start thinking about it. What really happens is that when the caterpillar goes into the cocoon, the entire body of the caterpillar just dissolves. It essentially digests itself and turns its whole body into caterpillar soup. And then one, just a few cells use that soup and grow into the butterfly. So essentially the whole body of the caterpillar disappears. It just, tur it just dissolves and turns into goo and then a brand new creature from just a few cells grows right from scratch and grows into the butterfly. And when you think about that it's kind of amazing because it's not really one animal transforming its body shape. It's almost like there are two different animals. One animal is carrying the DNA for the butterfly inside its body and it spends its entire life just eating and growing, making food for this other animal that's eventually going to grow from that DNA. So it lives its life, it dies, essentially the caterpillar dies, its body dissolves, and then a brand new creature in those cells uses the soup you know, the food from that old body and grows a brand new animal. Did you follow me there? <laughs> the cells that grow into the butterfly, I think they call them imaginal cells. And groups of them are called imaginal discs. Another way to put it is that in the DNA of the caterpillar butterfly, there are two sets of instructions. At the beginning, the caterpillar instructions are activated and a caterpillar develops. The butterfly part of the DNA is dormant. And when the caterpillar makes its cocoon and its body dissolves, now in the cells that are remaining that aren't dissolved, the butterfly DNA is activated and a butterfly grows. I feel like from a strictly biological and scientific point of view, it's the same animal and it's the same genome doing both. But just from a practical point of view and thinking about it kind of like common sense, it's almost like there are two animals sharing the same DNA. One animal, it's like they made a deal with each other. Like, uh, okay, I will live my life and I will grow big and fat and when I die you can be born and you can consume my body and then now you can grow. So it's like two animals for the price of one. I'm sure biologists would be screaming at me that's way too simple and too dumb but uh, yeah it's a fascinating idea. Well it is five after seven and uh, I'm standing outside the butterfly park the park just opened up and that's the time that I love to arrive at different places. So I'm going to uh, head inside and uh, look at some butterflies.
I don't think there's much danger of a snatch thief inside the butterfly park. But uh, yeah, they're giving you a little bit of a warning here, just to be careful. This uh, happened to me in Indonesia, by the way. I was actually riding my bicycle and a man on a motorcycle came up beside me and I thought he just wanted to say hello, to chat, you know, ask me what country I'm from. But instead, he leaned over, grabbed my smartphone, and then drove off real fast. So, uh, yeah, you do have to be careful when you see uh, people on motorcycles following you. And if you see two men on a motorcycle, that's something to really be careful of because it's a good chance they are snatch thieves. And we are entering into the Butterfly Park. The entrance isn't quite as elaborate as at the Bird Park. Here it is down there, down the stairs, and then they have a curtain of green chain, plastic chain, I'm sure. Let's see, plastic or metal? Yeah, plastic. And inside, butterflies. Let's see. Ah, look at this. Well, there's certainly no doubt of where you are, because as soon as you walk in, there's butterflies everywhere. I have no idea how they operate this butterfly park, now that I think about it. How do they get the butterflies to begin with? I mean, there must be a breeding program. Do they buy butterfly cocoons from other places? Are there supply houses for this kind of thing? Do they uh, breed their own and get uh, eggs and have caterpillars hidden away somewhere? Are there caterpillars in the park? That's an interesting question because caterpillars eat a lot of leaves and they wouldn't want them, you know, devouring the entire park if the caterpillars got out of control. I have no idea. Maybe we'll find out at some point. Maybe there's a display uh, talking about that. From a technical point of view, what I think I'm going to do is walk through the whole park with this wide-angle lens first and just look around and relax and take it all in and then maybe I'll switch over to uh, more of a telephoto lens and try to get closer to some of the butterflies. Because right now with my eyes, I'm seeing all kinds of beautiful butterflies. Just in this area in front of me, I see so many different species. But in this wide angle lens, you're probably not uh, seeing very much in the video. This is the entrance into the butterfly park. And then you come down these stairs. And they have some bathrooms down here, women and men. And a little pond over here. Yeah, I don't know if it comes out on the video or not, but there are quite a few butterflies up ahead there. I've already been uh, smacked in the in the eye actually by a couple of butterflies came uh, whipping by and then kind of gave me a little smack in the eye with their wings as they went past wow there's a beautiful one up ahead right here sunning himself and i don't know what this uh, wide angle lens will capture of this but i guess they must be a uh, relatively used to people and their cameras. Oh, I got a bit too close. There's another one up here. I don't know the names of any of these uh, species. And a big butterfly took a special interest in me. I'm actually kind of sweating a lot, so I think he uh, senses the moisture on my face. Ah. You can really feel the wind from his wings. He's flitting in front of the lens a little bit. Probably get glimpses of him. There he is. Oh. Trying to stay still so that uh, I don't uh, disturb the queer guy. 
So this is already worth the uh, the price of admission for me. Uh oh. Maybe I should have worn bright colors like red and yellow, and all these butterflies would think I was a a flower or something. Oh, landed on me here. I wonder if he's a. Oh, there's a little bit of green right on my shirt there, isn't there? Like the uh, the logo of the, the shirt maker, and maybe that looked like a butterfly, like something he could. Uh, looks like a flower, maybe to him. I've turned into a naturalist all of a sudden. Oh, there, buddy. What are you doing down there? I'm starting to see how uh, children in particular would really get a kick out of this place, especially if they're city kids and they haven't had much opportunity to go out in the uh, forest and, and see butterflies and things like that. Being a Canadian, of course, uh, I've seen a lot of butterflies and insects in my lifetime. But even for me, so far, yeah, this is a wonderful experience. I'm enjoying this uh, very much. And I've only gone like 15, 20 feet into the park. This will be of interest to very few people, but I remember, you know, as a young boy, I, when I collected butterflies and collected insects, when you mounted the butterflies in your collection, what I was taught to do was to take the wings and move them up so that the two top wings were quite high and then separated from the uh, lower wings. And you could kind of see all of the wing that way. But Later on, I learned that when a butterfly comes to rest, it doesn't ever hold its wings that way. This is how they hold their wings. They're actually held down lower like that. So that's the more natural posture. And after I collected all my butterflies and mounted them, I realized that I'd mounted them in a completely artificial way. One thing I've noticed is you uh, can't be too nervous about spider webs if you come to this place, especially early in the morning, because the trails are so narrow and spiders will build their webs across the, uh, the middle, of course. And I've already walked through a whole bunch of them. I've got spider webs all over my face. Maybe if you come later in the day, people who came early like me have already cleared out all the spider webs, so you'll be safe. Ah, spider web. Wow, a feeding station. Oh, this is amazing. I guess they put flowers out and then they spray them with a honey solution, 10% honey, 90% water, as supplementary food for the adult butterflies in case there is a shortage of natural nectar from the living flowers. So yeah, this is a breakfast buffet for these guys. The butterflies really like these corners for some reason. And they do like to fly up near the top, near the net. I guess maybe they're trying to fly up and the uh, net gets in their way. I don't know if this net is acting like an insulating layer or something. Because it's uh, early in the morning, but it is hot in here. It is a steam bath. <laughs> Just dripping with sweat. Wow. Uh, I was thinking about the kind of simple entrance that they had here with just those uh, green plastic chains. It was not nearly as elaborate as the entrance to the bird park. And that makes a lot of sense because 
if a couple of butterflies escape. You know, it's not that big a deal, but at the bird park, you wouldn't want their prize, you know, rhinoceros hornbill to get out of the park and uh, go on the run. On my uh, trip to the bird park, I suggested that you might want to bring some water. For the butterfly park, you definitely want to bring some water. I've already uh, drunk half the bottle of water that I brought with me. And it's a much smaller park here, so it's not like you're going to find kiosks inside, you know, to buy water from. They do have a gift shop and I believe a coffee shop, and you could buy water there, I'm sure. But uh, they don't have uh, stores, you know, inside the butterfly garden area itself. So bring some water. <laughs> you'll, you'll be glad you did. And this guy just left from the feeding station. I guess he's had his full of honey for the moment. And he's just digesting his meal, sitting on a fence post. I really like that feeding station for the butterflies. It's the only one I've seen so far. I hope uh, they have some more of them in the park. And then the butterflies are, you know, get quite close to you. It's interesting to see their uh, proboscis, I think that's what it's called, you know, the little mouth part that they use to drink the nectar. They're very uh, precise with that proboscis, you know, very uh, skilled at getting at the nectar. A nice shady path. I'm glad to find it. As I said, it's getting pretty hot underneath this uh, netting. And they also have koi fish ponds and turtles here. And I think they're down below me here on the left. So I'm going to walk along this path and then head down and uh, see if we can find some turtles. The proboscis of the butterfly is actually a good example of what I was babbling about earlier with the uh, metamorphosis from a caterpillar to a butterfly because when I was in elementary school I had this image of a caterpillar inside the cocoon and then a proboscis grows out of its face and of course that's not what happens as I said the uh, caterpillar body just turns into goo into soup basically and then there will be an imaginal cell in there with the DNA instructions to build a proboscis and it will activate after the caterpillar dies, technically. And then uh, it will use the soup, you know, the body of the caterpillar, all the spare parts and all the energy to build a proboscis. And uh, a butterfly is formed. Science. We found another feeding station. It's interesting, an entirely different species of butterfly is coming to this one. They're uh, smaller ones. And of course, there's tons of other insects in here, I imagine. I just see a bunch of ants crawling over these flowers to get the honey. I think my favorite butterflies were always the ones kind of like this one here. You can't see it now, but the edges of his wings are all crinkly. They're not smooth and round, but they have like a, a jagged shape on the edges, kind of like a, a leaf, you know? And I think that's how it developed in terms of protecting itself, because it would look more like a leaf than anything else to uh, predators. Yeah, the, based on my hobby as a boy, this park is bringing back some memories because I just remembered the, uh, my favorite butterfly of all time was called the Morning Cloak. And if I remember right, it had the crinkly shape to the wings on the uh, outside. I'll have to look that up later. And this is quite nice. They have a walkway that goes through the, uh, the lakes and the fountains here. 
I was looking in one of these ponds a bit earlier and I saw a huge fish down there. It was like a four foot catfish or something like that. You can kind of see the uh, crinkly edges on the wings of this butterfly. And that's what I was talking about earlier. And we've got some uh, fish tanks here at the butterfly park. Not sure who this guy is. There's a big guy heading into his tunnel home, I guess. Now this is a popular feeding site. And they have uh, something special for them, I guess. Pineapple and some other kind of fruit. Look at that. Who knew that butterflies were so in love with uh, pineapples? Check out this guy over here. I was looking at the butterflies and I actually thought a leaf had fallen into the pineapple, but then the leaf started moving and I realized it's a butterfly with a leaf camouflage. Look at that. Looks exactly like a leaf and you really couldn't tell the difference. I can really smell the pineapple, so with their senses, I can only imagine what the butterflies smell. For them, this must be an unbelievably attractive spot to come to. Oh, I like this guy too. He's got rusty red wings. Look at that, it's gorgeous. He's getting right in there, right on top of that pineapple. And look at the colors on this one here. Beautiful. And based on all that stuff I was talking about, this is where the action is. Live pupa, or chrysalis. Ah, look at this. I have a moth, which I think must have recently come out of the uh, pupa. I was wondering if there were many moths in here. But of course, you wouldn't see them as much during the daytime, since they're nocturnal. But if this guy's any evidence, they do have moths here. Oh, he's gorgeous. And look at uh, the pupa for him. They wrap a leaf around themselves. And they uh, look uh, exactly like a leaf. Good protection from predators. It looks like they have more of them here at different stages or different types. And here's another moth that must have recently emerged. And another one up there. I've completed one circuit of the park and I think what I'm going to try to do is go 
outside into their cafe, maybe have a cup of coffee, and see if I can come in on the same ticket. I don't see why that wouldn't be possible, but uh, there's no one in the park, like there's no staff in here that you could ask uh, questions of. Found another feeding station. So yeah, I found five or six of these scattered around the park. They're really a nice addition. I'm in the gift shop and uh, coffee shop now, though I don't see any hot coffee anywhere. You can't really order from anyone, but they have some uh, refrigerators behind me, so I got a Wanda Premium Cold Coffee, and that's, uh, that's good enough. To get here, I pretty much had to exit the park and go through their uh, educational exhibit of all the other insects and spiders and things like that. And that looked amazing. I think I could spend an hour in there. I couldn't ask anyone if I could come out, have coffee, and then go back in, but I don't see why that would be a, a problem. The bonus question for the last video was about the Chinese zodiac animals. The animals were included in the zodiac based on how they finished in a race. But why didn't the dog finish first? After all, the dog can run very fast and it's a very strong swimmer, so why didn't it come in in first place? The answer is that the dog is just too playful. Instead of swimming across the river and winning the race, he stopped and had fun. In fact, he had so much fun playing in the water and jumping around that he came in 11th place. Bonus question for this video. Butterflies are great travelers. In fact, there's one butterfly from Canada that travels 3,000 miles to Mexico on a long migration. What is the name of that butterfly? Put your answer in the comments below. Answer at the end of the next video. Travel tip 21. Pack a loud whistle for emergencies. I mentioned in the video that in Indonesia a man on a motorcycle stole my smartphone. When it happened I tried to shout for someone to help me, but what could I shout? If I shouted thief or some other word in English or even help, no one in Indonesia would understand me and I didn't know the Indonesian words for thief or robber. So all the Indonesians saw was some foreigner shouting and pointing and they had no idea what I was talking about or what I was doing. But there is one sound that is the same in every country and in every language. It is loud, it is clear, and it is the sound of help and an emergency and that is the sound of a whistle. When people hear a whistle, they pay attention and they know that something is wrong. So it is a very good idea to bring an emergency whistle with you. After I was robbed in Indonesia, I bought this one. The brand is called Windstorm. It is very, very loud, lightweight, and it even works when it is full of water. You can use a whistle like this in all kinds of situations. Maybe you go on a long hike and you get lost. You can blow the whistle to call for help. Maybe you're swimming or snorkeling and a riptide pulls you out into the sea. A whistle can also call for help. Maybe some bad looking dudes are following you down a dark street in a dangerous part of town. You can blow your whistle 
and uh, maybe scare them away. It's true that you might never need your emergency whistle. You could even go on a long trip of one year or two years and never need to blow on it. But if you have it, it might save your life or just help you out in a bad situation. No, I'm not going to do it. Trust me, I tried it once before inside a room like this and it is so loud that it really hurts your ears. You only want to blow it outside or in a real emergency.